there you have it. We knew they were going to bloat it. We've been reporting on this, but we're not all alone on this discussion. In fact, now that we have Rand Paul standing on the Senate floor, he's a doctor. And by the way, he suffered coronavirus and survived it himself. Um, I want to bring on a senator and a doctor right now who's been talking a lot about this. Scott Jensen joins me right now. Uh, Scott, I've seen you on Fox News. I've seen you all over. You're a doctor. You're also involved in politics. Um, you know, we reported several weeks ago that it looks very much like the CDC is asking doctors and coroners or whoever fills out these forms to bloat the numbers. Go ahead and take it, make it all COVID-19. Mm -hmm. If I got that wrong, you're a doctor. What was your experience when you saw this recommendation by the CDC on the death certificates? Well, that was actually April 3rd, Adele, and I had never seen something like that before. All of a sudden, I read this document from the Department of Health, and it said, go ahead and diagnose COVID-19. It didn't say put down probable. It said, go ahead and put it COVID-19. You just showed it on your uh, screen before. And so then I went to the CDC document, and that flies completely in the face of the manual that CDC puts out as to how death certificates should be filled out. In the manual, it talks about specificity and precision. And all of a sudden, we're being told, well, if it's reasonable, if it's likely, if it's probable or it's presumptive, go ahead and put that down. That was what caused me to raise this up the flagpole, if you will, and say, hey, I've never been coached or told before that this is what I need to do. And so I checked with 50 to 75 physicians in Minnesota, and none of them could remember it either. We didn't have that happen in 2018 when we had 60 to 80,000 deaths from influenza. If I diagnosed pneumonia and I put that on the death certificate, nobody was telling me to put influenza on it as well if I happened to be in the middle of a flu epidemic. If I didn't test for it, if I didn't have an interest in testing for it, then I certainly shouldn't be putting it on the death certificate. Wow. And so when you think about it, when you think about what's happening, can we then assume, you know, and, and, and look, I want to be clear. Doctors are good people. They mean well. They also really, you know, I think that one of the things that we've learned, you know, on the high wire is they really want to do what the CDC tells them to do. The CDC writes the Bible in many ways of how they move forward, what they're supposed to do. So in, in this case, you have doctors doing what they're being told to do. It also helps, I think, bring funding into the, the hospital, I would think, you know, uh, but is it, do you think that there's a real likelihood that these death rates, if we really went back, I, I know that Italy had said that 99% of the deaths in Italy uh, had comorbidities, other life-threatening illnesses, and when their health department went back through, they said you should really look at it as though only 12% of death certificates have shown a direct causality from coronavirus. Do you feel like that might be an accurate way how we should be looking at the overall death numbers right now? Absolutely. Typically, death certificates are filled out based on causation. And now we're simply saying, well, you can just correlate it to what happens to be going around. I mean, we, we never do things like that. So I think that undermines the public trust. And then if you start looking at the actual numbers of how dollars come into this, when someone adds a diagnosis to a death certificate or a hospital discharge summary, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing anything wrong. I've been in hospitals for 35 years, and I've had administrative clerical type of coding people come alongside of me and say, Dr. Jensen, I noticed that you discharged this patient with heart failure and pneumonia. And I say, yeah, that's right. That's what they had. And they'll say, well, but they also had a low potassium. And I say, yeah, but the low potassium really didn't have a lot to do with what we did during the hospitalization. But the, the person, the coding person would say, but they did have it. So if we put that diagnosis down, we might get paid more. And it's true. And the fact of the matter was they had a low potassium. So I'll add that diagnosis. That oftentimes matters. We've been told by hospitals for Medicare patients, it's way better for us to put down dehydration as the primary diagnosis and diarrhea as the second. Sec because if you flip it, you get paid less. So there's no question. Hospital administrators will coach us. And that's when I put some information out as to how much do you get paid for a standard pneumonia if it's a Medicare patient? How much do you get paid for if it's COVID-19? How much do you get paid if it's COVID-19 with a what ventilator? What are those numbers? These things matter. What are those well, numbers? I actually sent them over to you. But if a typical garden variety pneumonia without complications for a Medicare patient will be about $5,000. If you have COVID-19 pneumonia, it's about $13,000. Wow. And if you use a ventilator, it's $39,000. And these numbers come straight from CMS. Right there they are. Wow, look at that. Wow, that's fascinating. You know, you bring up the ventilators... 
Um, you know, I was just reporting that Stat News is now saying that the NIH has put out new guidelines trying to back people away from ventilators. Uh, much of this appears in, and we talked about this with Jeffrey Jackson, uh, we've been hearing about incredibly high death rates from ventilators. Uh, many people remember uh, Kyle Seidel coming forward in New York saying, I mean, really like screaming from a mountaintop, like Paul Revere saying, I don't know what this is, but it does not appear to be, you know, the, you know, ARDS as we know it, acute respiratory distress syndrome. These people don't have liquid in their lungs. They're talking to me. They are, they're coherent, and I'm putting them in a coma and putting a ventilator down their throat. This video came out uh, just over the last couple of days. We weren't able to vet who this is, but he's saying something similar. So just so people get an idea, I want to ask you if this is true, but first, I don't know if you saw this video. Take a look at this. I am a respiratory therapist. I've been doing this for 21 years. Um, and I've been kind of all, all over the place doing this. I want to show you our equipment room here. Uh, so we want to talk about COVID-19. First thing I want to say is, is, does it look like there's a ventilator shortage? <laughs> there's not. Okay, let's talk about ventilators and why there would be a shortage of ventilators. Well, this is non-invasive ventilation here, CPAP or BiPAP. This is a mask that gets strapped on you, and we can help you breathe with that. We're not allowed to use those, okay? Um, we're finally opening it up to where we can use them a little bit, but for the most part, since COVID came out, they said absolutely not. That's going to cause uh, the virus to spread. Uh, all over the place by spraying aerosols everywhere and so we can't use it you have to let the patient crash and go straight to a ventilator okay traditionally that's not the way we would treat a patient we also have aerosolized medications bronchodilators we're not allowed to use those either so everything that we would traditionally do uh, we're not allowed to do now uh, the, the, I found this video interesting because I've had a lot of uh, anonymous reports from doctors that didn't want to speak out, not quite as brave as yourself, and, and saying exactly this, that we were not using oxygen because there was a concern that it would aerosolize. Therefore, we were just letting these people like get to the point where they're starved of oxygen and then just moving straight into a ventilator. Now, I don't mean to put you on the spot, and this really wasn't what you came on for, but since you're involved in this, is there accuracy to this discussion? <laughs> And is this, when we see new guidelines from the NIH, are they now saying, let's use those other oxygen techniques versus, you know, waiting for a ventilator? Is there any truth to this story from your perspective? Well, this story was problematic for me, and I had seen the video because he didn't identify who he was. Right. I think part of what it indicates is that initially our understanding of this disease was overly simplistic. We initially thought it was mucus plugs, and then we thought it was alveolar damage. And then we started saying, well, gee, if we just jack up the pressure, we don't seem to be helping these people. Instead of one out of three people dying on a ventilator, we're having two out of three people die. Wow. So I think what we've learned is that corona, the COVID-19 disease, is a multi-system encroachment. I mean, we're seeing people with blood in their urine. We're seeing impact on liver. So we've really had to take a step back. And I think we're trying to learn as fast as we can. But I think that your basic question is, is this ventilator shortage the crisis that we had been led to believe? For a variety of reasons, one of them being that ventilators may not be as useful as we thought. I think that we're going to, at the end of this corona epidemic, when we get to the other side, we're gonna see unpacked ventilators sitting on pallets. Because mm -hmm. we, in Minnesota, for every ventilator being used, we probably have five to 10 waiting on the sidelines. Wow. And I think that this is a huge issue. And I think what we did is we hit the panic button. But you know, Dale, if I could be so bold, I would just like to say, one of the things I'm really concerned about is moving the goalposts. Initially, yeah. we were told, stay with us, build the public trust, social distancing, and we're gonna have to lock you down because we really need to stop this transmission. The initial rationale was we need to flatten the curve, we need to build up our preparation so we don't overwhelm our hospital facilities. Right now, most hospitals, everyone virtually in Minnesota, they're dying on the vine. Their occupancy rates are 25%. We're losing $31 million a day in hospital. We wow. have flattened the curve. We have pushed the peak down. We have adequate hospital c capabilities now. If, if we've done the things that we wanted to do, then why would we continue to lock down 
There's no reason to. You've already said very persuasively that wherever we end up on the fatality rate here, it's going to be somewhere between 0.1 and 0.4. It's not going to be anywhere near the 30% that MERS was in 2013. It's not going to be the 10% that SARS might have been in 2003. It's not going to be the 5 to 10% in 1918. This is going to be somewhere one out of 200 people, one out of 1,000, somewhere in there. So we've got to revitalize America because when it comes to mind, body, and spirit, the mind and the spirit are being crushed and we're focusing entirely on the body and the virus. And we know that 40 to 50% of the people don't even know they have the disease. We know that. And another 40 to 50% are gonna skate through it. So folks, let's press the chill button. We're okay. Let's get back to work. So let me ask you this. I mean, you're saying, you know, these numbers 0 0.1, 0 0.4, you know, somewhere in that range. You're also, you know, at the same time saying that the numbers we're looking at that are, are giving us that sense could very well be bloated. But I want to ask you one more question because we are seeing, as I think you've, you know, clearly, and I know you have to be careful about this, and hospitals are doing the best they can, and everyone's learning what they can. And we can look back in hindsight and say, did the NIH move fast enough? Did we have an investigation into what were the actual symptoms? Could we have, you know, learned faster? But it does seem clear that ventilating everybody on this probably did raise the death rate. And my question to you is, as we're seeing, you know, success with multiple approaches from hydroxychloroquine to, you know, different sort of um, um, blood products that are bringing in antibodies, and then, of course, if we start moving into oxygen and moving away from ventilators, couldn't we assume that had this all happened over again, or if they're talking about maybe a, perhaps a relapse in the fall where, you know, coronavirus comes back, couldn't we assume that this death rate will be even lower, not just because of the bloated numbers, because we'll actually treat it better the next time around? I think that's an excellent point. I think you're absolutely right. The reason that in, two, in the year 1900, 1900 the, one of the leading causes of death was influenza slash pneumonia was because we didn't have antibiotics. So in 1918, it was devastating. 50 million people dying. We're in that same situation, it's just not an antibody. Now we're trying to understand the mechanism of disease and we've got brilliant medical centers, physicians working hard to understand this. And you give us another month and we're gonna be a lot smarter than we are today. We've already seen that with the ventilators, whether it ends up being hydroxychloroquine, whether it ends up being convalescent plasma, whether it ends up being some of our antiviral agents, we're working desperately hard and even the development of a vaccine, which may or may not be helpful. That's going to be, if that, that's already being fast tracked. So come October, I have every con. Nope. Did we lose you, Scott? All right. Well, I think we've just lost Scott Jensen, but oh, here we go. Here we go. Very quickly. Wait. Yes, so we could see that. When we had Jerry Ford getting his vaccine on TV or on the newspapers, we end up having to stop that program because of the high incidence of Guillain-Barre. So we need to not put all of our hopes on a vaccine. We need to also let our own immune systems build a herd immunity. If we can get to 60, 70 percent of the population, we've accomplished a lot. And that's where we're heading. That's all fantastic news. Some of it broke up, but I get the sense of it. What you're saying is, you know, we've got to develop antibodies ourselves. That's what we're seeing. We have a large number already there. Let's continue this journey. Let's take care of those that are at risk, right? This very small percentage that clearly are having an acute issue. Let's make sure that they're protected while the rest of us go back to work. If most of us are not going to have symptoms. For others, very mild. And this idea of leaning on a vaccine somewhere in the future, uh, we have seen problems with that before. And it looks like we have a way out of this, that the numbers are going to stay low in around the flu. And so uh, my last question to you, you are also a politician. You're a state representative. And, you know, people are watching this show. There's a lot of people trying to wake up their friends and say, look, the studies are showing it. We can handle this. We can get out. We know how to deal with it now. Uh, we're getting better and better at it. What should someone do with their politics to say, I want to go back to my job. I'm not afraid of something that has a death rate of 0.1 to 0.2 or 3%. 
Uh, that's what the studies are showing. What is it we need to do as a people to end Groundhog Day here? To not have to wake up tomorrow morning to the same song on our alarm clock and this really droll, you know, depressing time where we're watching our jobs just pour down the drain. What do we need to do uh, to get our government to wake up here? That's a great question. I wish I could be more optimistic. The problem is so many states have been functioning on executive orders from the governor. So even though we have perhaps 201 legislators, we're not having 201 decision makers. We're having a, a governor and his team. So we need to focus our efforts at the governor and, and let that governor know. And in Minnesota, I think Governor Walz has gotten a lot of input, a lot of feedback. And we just need to double down and redouble our efforts and get as much input to him and say, we want to get back to work. Because quite frankly, I feel impotent myself. I don't feel like I'm being given the opportunity to really help influence our policy. I feel like I'm standing on the sidelines watching just as much as, as you are, and it's frustrating as all get out. It really is. And, and so let me ask you this. I mean, I, I keep thinking this is the last question, but you are such a great guest because you're, you're, you're on all sides of this. You know, are the governors looking at the USC study? Are they looking at the Stanford study? Did they recognize that the imperial model crashed? Um, or is this just, just some sort of like drone clone army being put out by this tiny group of, of, of scientists that don't seem to want to accept the reality that this just isn't as deadly? Are they getting a broad range of information around them? Um, are they looking at all these things? It's a great question. I think they're, they're getting a glimpse of it, but I think what happens to elected leaders so readily, and I mean, I've only been in the Senate four years, but I've certainly watched us get captured in an echo chamber. And we have people around us that they say what we wanna hear. And the idea of being skeptical, that's one of the most powerful things we can do in America is engage fully. And you've said that many times, we need Americans to feel empowered and know that they don't have to participate in groupthink. Groupthink, is a dangerous step. I've said this before. It was groupthink that allowed nearly a thousand people in 1978 to follow Jimmy Jones and drinking some cyanide lace Kool-Aid. We don't want to be about that. That's not America's history. It's not our heritage. We need to be empowered. And that's partly why I've spoken up. I am a skeptic. Do I appreciate Governor Walz's efforts? Absolutely. But do I feel like I've been given one uh, sixty seventh of the Senate's uh, fractional impact on what we're doing? Absolutely not. I feel frustrated. I feel impotent. And I get phone calls from patients who say, I've got a breast lump. And to me, this isn't an elective surgery. I want this thing removed. And I don't feel better because someone says it's not likely to be a breast cancer. And even if it is, it's probably slow growing. I want it out yesterday. And I've had to wait two months. America, wake up. This is your country. Thank you so much for all that great information. Senator Dr. Scott Jensen, thank you for taking the time and joining us. Uh, really, really important to hear from you. Thank you.